why your ego is not your amigo. The grassroots of meditation and how to elevate your frequency to a whole new level. Welcome to episode 43 with the CEO of Bitcoin Energy, Shil Patel. You are listening to Len Jones, Party of Two where experts and influencers speak honestly and openly about their keys to success. Sponsored by TrueFace.ai, where your face is the key. For more information on TrueFace, please contact your host at ian at TrueFace.ai. Now, pay close attention, because you're going to learn today. Oh, what up, what up, party people? Happy Tuesday. It is a fantastic day out here in my hometown of Albany, New York. Shout out. And I got my mama making the home-cooked meals, feeling good. My father had an event this weekend called Spay Nation, which is a conservation group nonprofit that dedicates money to helping salmon and steelhead fisheries. And it was awesome. Imagine like six to 800 fishermen from all around the world coming together to learn how to spay cast and then having a ton of drinks and getting crazy out there. It was fun. But you know, feeling good, making moves this week. I hope this week has been a game changer for you. I hope you're putting actions into play and just in making in making moves like there's so much opportunity out there there's so much things that you could do to change your life six months from now you could be a totally different person people always underestimate what they can do in six months to a year don't let that be you and know what's interesting i've had so many friends that have gotten into the financial services industry particularly and so many of them have failed like so many such a little amount of people ever win in that industry where you're constantly grinding and i recently had a buddy of mine who's just been relentless always on the phone always building rapport and the dude is killing it you want to know what he's doing that's so different is he's building relationships and he's being genuine when you are genuine to people and you have people's best interest at heart you're not selling anymore you're helping so how can you help in your business versus sell so today's guest, Sheila Patel. Oh man, I'm stoked. Sheila was a big part of my journey in entrepreneurship. I remember I went to an event way back in the day and back when I was probably about 20 years old and I remember showing up to this event. I was in like a t-shirt, shorts, like not looking that fly. And I roll up to this event and here's this dude in like a three-piece suit looking super fly. Like I'm just looking at him like he looks like a million bucks. I look like a dumpster. And that was the first time I met Sheila. We did an event together, ended up becoming such good friends. I remember I crashed on his couch for like three or four months on and off, but we just developed such a good friends. And he has really been a huge mentor in my life and really helped contribute into bringing me into this mindset of like, wow, entrepreneurship, being a better version of you showing up the way you want people to see you and, you know, feel good, look good, be good, all good. So one thing that is really exciting about him is he's a masterful culture producer. He is fantastic as setting the standard and setting the tide and just as a magnet of energy. On top of that, Sheil actually operates in both traditional business, online sales, and many different ways. He owns multiple cellular stores, which is very, very interesting. He goes over that in the podcast. Sheil's also been in direct sales for over a decade and has a ton of experience and stories just in personal development and growth. On top of that, he's now the CEO of Bitcoin Energy, which is an energy drink geared towards the crypto space. Very interesting. So he's got a lot of things going on and he absolutely smashed this podcast. Shields energy, Shields words, they're just so in line with what this podcast is all about. Improving ourselves, making moves and getting these freaking goals. So guys, I'm fired up, fired up to come here, fired up for you guys that are listening. I want you to get your pen, paper out, unlock your ears, you know what I'm saying? Open up the golden gates of knowledge because we're coming in deep with my friend, Mr. Shield Patel. Shield, it's time to roll. Let's get into it. Shil Patel, everybody. How you guys doing? Mr. Len Patel. Jones, finally, I'm a party of two. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember when I was crashing on your couch for like six months. A lot of good times. Lots of fun times. Lots of fun times. We've been through a lot. Shil, yeah, you've been all over the place. You've been in traditional business. You've crushed it in network marketing. You're in the crypto space. You're, you got a new puppy. You're getting married. Things are moving real fast for you. Things are moving. <laughs> You know, I waited such a long time to uh, uh, kind of start the whole chapter of my life uh, personally, you know, with the family and thinking about those those types of things. And um, I think I was so focused on, on business for so long, um, getting after it and traveling that um, I don't want to say I neglected it, but I uh, 
I, I just wasn't a priority at the time. And uh, now that it is, it's, uh, it's so fun, you know, uh, it, it's like a, an experience that I haven't experienced yet. And so um, I'm happy, I'm excited. And, um, you know, they say that when it rains, it pours. And so that's, that's kind of the idea right now for me in my own life is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because everything's firing on all cylinders. It's cool because it seems like you're really allowing yourself to just truly embrace pure happiness and joy. Totally, totally. You know what's crazy, too, about finding a companion in life and moving in that direction of settling down, thinking about a family is that, um, you know, for so long, there's this hunt right? You're hunting like a, like a caveman. And when you're hunting, there's this, I, I, I want to call it a distraction, you know, because so much of your mind is occupied in the hunt, the chase. And, um, you know, when that, that part of life isn't occupying your brain, that brain juice is being diverted, delivered into all the other areas of your life. And uh, it's so powerful, dude. It's insane. Yeah, I need to get some of that brain juice that you're on because that stuff could, <laughs> that stuff could sell like crazy. And <laughs> speaking of the juice, you've sold all types of juices. <laughs> <the world. laughs> and the fact is, is you know, you've done it super, super successfully. You have a very, very unique story. I'd like to kind of get a little background on day one entrepreneurship and Shield Patel's life. I started selling cell phones in the mall. Actually, I started at Best Buy when I was 16 years old. That was my first like sales job, customer service, you know. I did a few other things before that. You know, I worked in department stores trying to make money and folding clothes for Christmas. I was uh, working at a hardware store. I did whatever job I could get. But it was when I started working at Best Buy that I started learning how to actually make an impact in sales and uh, understand the customer and how to be able to deliver a message um, that I'm conveying. And so we were selling warranties and it was awesome. I was 16 years old, started in the uh, printer aisle, selling ink cartridges. Next thing you know, I'm selling on all, you know, I'm selling ACs in the summertime, I'm selling TVs, I'm selling laptops. I was nuts, you know, and that was a long time ago, over <laughs> almost 20 years ago. So yeah, and then from there, um, you know, it just evolved. I started selling cell phones in the mall. Uh, that was fun because, you know, my commissions went through the roof and I started training. I started developing uh, a whole new set of skills. Um, Best Buy was more of a non-commission type of a, a job. And then selling cell phones was like, you got to hustle if you want to get paid. Right. And, um, you know, it was at that time I learned the power of focus. Because that what I just said earlier about diverting that brain juice, I was starting to practice some of that at 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, selling cell phones in the mall when all the other kids were flirting with all the girls walking by in the mall, taking extra long breaks. And, you know, they'd, they'd sell maybe 30, 40 new activations or lines a month. And I'm crushing three, 400 a month because I'm closing lines everywhere. I'm talking to everybody in the mall. So I, I think a lot of things happened because at that time also Facebook, you know, didn't even exist yet. So there was no such thing as social media. And so your way of prospecting in MLM was going to the mall and guess who was the number one prospect? <laughs> Me, I'm in the mall annoying the hell out of everybody. And they're like, we need this guy on our team. Right. And so I got pitched on every single MLM deal and uh, it wasn't until a buddy of mine just uh, came up to me and um, just after many conversations dripping on me, uh, I ended up hiring him actually to come sell cell phones for me in the mall. Uh, and every day he was so broke, he didn't have money to get to his job. So I would drive him and he would drip on me and build rapport with me. And we'd talk about residual income and it was like water on the rocks. It, it developed a, a framework in my mind and a belief system that I shouldn't just keep working over and over again. Um, it, it, I should work and expect to get paid for the rest of my life. I Recently, about maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, I had a friend of mine 
hit me up that I was hanging out with in Mexico City while I was there for a wedding. Crazy story. I, I haven't even told you about this because it's been, we haven't caught up in so long. But, you know, I, was, um, I, I used to do tons of events in Mexico City. So I've known so many people in Mexico City. Half my passport is full of Mexico. And, um, you know, I, I, I remember meeting up with a bunch of guys when I was out there to catch up. I haven't been out here in a couple of years. How you been? One of the guys who I just really enjoy his company and uh, looks up to me so much and respects me. And so we, we always have a good time hanging out together and um, calls me about a week or two when I get home. After getting home, he goes, hey, I have an opportunity for you. I go, here we go. <laughs> Let me hear it. And so we're talking on the phone and he goes, I want you to be the political liaison uh, for us. He sell, he has now selling, he's now selling, uh, oil, um, you know, to the government and all <clears throat> on a whole nother level, you know, and he worked with that, that oil life. That's a whole nother level. <laughs> I know oil money. It's crazy. And so he's, you know, now like a 50% owner of this company. So he worked his way up, bought into it. Um, and he was telling me his partner and him have this, uh, other project non MLM related. I go, okay, talk to me. What do you got? And he said, they're building highways, uh, in this one particular state of Mexico, and they're going to collect tolls for the next 75 years. Okay. Okay. I was, I was thinking he's going to be asking me for some money or something. That's the next thing, right? He says, we're completely funded. Okay. <laughs> what do you need from me? What? He goes, well, we want you to just represent us and speak for us on both sides you know through to all our investors all the politicians and mexico and america and back and forth and i'm like hmm so you're gonna tie me to 70 years of tolls to speak i'm in <laughs> <laughs> because way back when i was 19 you know i'm in this car with my buddy and he just permeates it through my brain that you cannot, you can't beat that type of income. You know, it's, it's a compounding income till today. I benefit generously because of all the work I've done since I was 19 in the MLM space and everything, even in the cell phone space till today. I mean, and so that idea has become a cornerstone of all the, the work that I do every day when I wake up. And so um, why work one time and get paid only one time to never, ever see it again when you can work one time and get paid, you know, for a long period of time. So um, that was the first thing that happened, I think, for me was that shift from linear income to compound income. And so that at 19 years old was a big, big shift. And I, I joined MLM. Uh, it was more of like uh, the first few years was like going to college. You know, it was like I'm learning, you know, and I failed and I was broke and I didn't know what I was doing and I was just doing it wrong and I was doing it slow and I was <clears throat> not getting anywhere. I think my first year in MLM, I might have made, I'd be lucky if I made five grand. It was not good. And you know, I slowly worked my way up. Um, and that company, I, they changed their name a bunch of times. They changed their pay structure and they had terrible ownership and management and leadership. And the two owners was a brother and sister that fought all the time. And it was just like, Oh my God, I wish I knew better. You know? Right. You don't uh, know what you don't know. You know, exactly. And so, um, you know, but it all kind of came together full circle because everything that I was doing all benefited each other. What I was learning in retail was impacting the MLM business. What I was learning in MLM was impacting retail and uh, created a great synergy, you know. And, um, and then 10 years later, uh, after, you know, uh, doing well in that company and dominating it and uh, we, I want to say I outgrew that company. Finally, uh, it, I would say a little too late. I wish I had done what I did earlier. And right. Um, but it's okay. You know, after 10 years of being involved with them, I um, stepped down and decided to, you know, look around. I spent about 90 days, uh, me and a partner of mine, we were looking at a different opportunity. And um, 
that's when uh, I came across Vima and BK, which I think you had on your podcast early on when you first started your show. I was with them the night before, actually, in California. And he goes, I'm going to go see Len Jones. I'm like, yo, Len Jones. Yeah. <laughs> we kept in touch because um, I just admire, out of all the things that I'd seen in a decade of doing MLM, um, he had just done an incredible job at building a great company. Incredible. And that's where I met you actually. Right. So right. we owe uh, a, a big sense of gratitude to the man above, you know, and BK, uh, became such a solid friend of mine. And, um, I loved what he was doing. I was excited. You know, he had his cans. I still got some cans. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I love, uh, the idea of taking this old school, been around a long time industry, vitamins and pills and potions and lotions and thigh cream and butt cream and all types of crazy stuff that great people buy it and whatnot, but nothing that exciting about it. And, you know, BK was just like, let's put it in an, let's put it in an energy drink. You know, let's put it in coffee. Let's put it in tea. And it just... Uh, made sense. So, um, you know, we started rocking with Vima actually. And um, that was a 13 month run. We killed it, crushed it and um, kept in touch with him. And that's, that's kind of uh, after that, what happened to Vima. If you don't know, you got to check out one of the episodes uh, on Len Jones. That's the whole story. <laughs> number eight, number eight. It was insane. Number eight tells you the whole background story, what happened there. And so when that happened, we, we, I, I diversified. I took the opportunity to say, let me step back a little bit. Let me not put all my eggs in one basket like I normally do. <laughs> you know, and you're so, an all in type of dude. You go all in. I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. And I wear the t shirt and the hat. You know, I go oh, all yeah. in. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it, it gave me um, uh, a, a humbling experience because I got to take time to kind of tone it down a notch, look at the entire, you know, 40,000 square foot view of my life. What am I doing? Where am I going? Am I hanging up the gloves? Am I doing something else? Am I, you know, and so I made great investments. That's actually when I was starting to buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin was like at like 300 bucks around that time. So it was like today, such a great decision looking back at, you know, at that moment because uh that turned into the be best decisions of my life you know i had told you about it at that time too that was a great move and so yeah uh, overall uh <clears throat> uh everyone i spoke to about it at that time they all thanked me today you know what i mean it's like everyone's so happy yes that's it that was the move and so um yeah we've kind of uh took that and turned it into a whole nother uh, perfect storm of opportunity because everything that I've done previously culminated into uh, circling back with BK again, like episode eight, <laughs> um, and uh, sends me a box of Bitcoin energy. And I'm like, this is the smartest thing I've seen done since Vima. Like, wow, you know, and I thought, uh, I've seen it all in the crypto space and, you know, although I never really put my name on anything in the crypto space and you know, I had kind of thrown a bunch of Bitcoin around everywhere. I even went, I remember I took, um, to my fiance to, uh, Puerto Rico for a 30th birthday, <clears throat> flew my partner in. It was his one year anniversary. I was like, let's go. I got a ton of Bitcoin. I'm a, I'm gonna do this whole trip on Bitcoin. Looking back at that trip, that trip today and today's value is like probably a quarter million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you know, it was crazy. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, did, I did really get excited about Bitcoin, but I never really put my hands in any type of vehicle. Uh, but when I saw Bitcoin Energy, I thought it was so smart because exactly what uh, Vima and Verve did for a, I want to say a stale, old, boring, dry industry like nutrition and supplements, vitamins and pills and stuff. Um, we had the same chance to do with Bitcoin and crypto, which is normally kind of boring and geeky and nerdy and, you know, a little hard to talk about. And, and, you know, I know you're a Game of Thrones fan. You put me on to that. And, uh, the last episode, I think something great for all your audience to hear is, uh, a lesson that I learned from from that last episode when Tyrion is like, you know, begging with all the 
powerful people of Westeros and they're deciding who the next leader is going to be. And uh, before he nominates Bran, who of all people, I don't know who liked it, who didn't like it. There was lots of controversy. Some people are like, what the hell, Bran? But, you know, my dad liked it, uh, loved it. He was crying like a, a baby, you know, the whole episode. Right. Um, he, he said something interesting. He said, it's always about the story and the story and how it lives on. And Bitcoin's got such a powerful story. No one knows who created it. I mean, what the heck? You don't know who created Bitcoin. Completely anonymous. This perfect invention of value being transacted over the internet. Wow. Anyways, I could get into the whole, you know, theory of Bitcoin and uh, I'm, I'm a big pro Bitcoiner, but you know, that, that, that part of Game of Thrones, um, told me, you know, we were on the right track because it's about how you tell the story and, uh, Bitcoin doesn't have a great way to tell the story because, you know, you're not at a party socializing, talking about Bitcoin usually. I mean, you do, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you know, most people lose their, uh, attention, you know, really quickly within eight seconds, like less than a goldfish I heard nowadays. So, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it, it captivates people uh, enough to be like, well, what is that product? And so, um, yeah, that's kind of my backstory and where I've gotten to. And, uh, you know, I've got a lot in my pipeline and what I'm doing and working on and I keep on adding but uh, yeah, uh, that's that's where I'm at, Len Jones. But dude, the thing that's so unique about you is your ability to dive into the culture. Like for you, when you were inside the direct sales business, you were all in and you basically encompassed so many people's personalities and you created this culture that was just enticing. And you know, you are someone that was a very motivational to me being on stage. I remember when we first did an event together, I show up to Shield Patel's event and I'm dressed like a bum, right? Like I'm in like basically shorts and a t-shirt. And, you know, back then, I, you know, I thought I was crushing it. I show up to his event. He's like looking like a five piece suit, looking like some Indian God. And I'm like, Jesus, I'm blowing it. And it's like, you know, who you rub on, like, <laughs> that sounded terrible. Who you, <laughs> who you talk to and who you associate with is so important to just become a better person. And every time you've ever made a move, you've always associated with the best of the best. You're like a little kid when it comes to getting into a new industry, like the crypto space. You're like a little kid. You're like so excited. You're yeah. such a nerd. And it, that's what makes it so exciting because you're meeting all these different people and that whole space, you're paving a new path that's always just excited you. What would you say to maybe when you first kind of got into that crypto space, did you ever have self doubts about it? Or to you, was it always just like, you were like, yup, this is it. This is the future. Or were there times you're like, yo, I'm crazy. This is, this is nuts. Yeah. You know, crypto is like such a wild ride. You know, it's like it, it up one day. I, I remember uh, having six figure days, you know, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm not going to lie. But then there's days you're like, what just happened to this market? You know? And people throwing in the towel and you hear all this bad news and they call it FUD uh, in the crypto space, F-U-D, F-U-D, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They have all these acronyms and lingual uh, for their own space. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there were many, many times, not just in crypto, but in my whole career as a professional, uh, MLM had gotten so hard. I, that was probably the hardest. I mean, Today, to me, MLM is the easiest thing you could do. You, you want to go do regular traditional business, good luck. With all the capital you're going to need and all the tools and resources and knowledge and legalities and accounting, and I mean, good luck. But MLM, sign up and go tell some people about it. I mean, it's the easiest thing, you know, but when I was 19, I... I, I, I couldn't wrap that around my head. How am I going to, how am I going to get on stage and fire people up? How am, people aren't going to listen to me, you know? And so, uh, I had a lot of struggle early on, uh, as a pro and, uh, nowadays I get to look at things objectively 
uh, crypto never was something that uh, I was desperate on. So it never, it never took my, it tugged at my emotions in that way. Um, because I, I, if crypto all disappeared, I'm still good. Like I've compounded my life in a way where I don't want things to disappear. I don't want things to fail, but if it does, you know, I've got multiple different businesses and income streams and, you know, cash flow that I work on, uh, regularly every day, you know? And so it's, um, it's a different mindset when you approach something that you're not desperate with, you know, but you know, I, I have to, uh, put a little asterisk in there cause some people might be mistaken and, and hear that and think, well, then you don't have hunger or desire. And, um, I, I disagree. You know, I, I wake up with hunger and desire every day. It's my strongest asset. It's why I win. It's why I beat my competition. It's why uh, I succeed is because I'm hungrier than everybody else. And so, you know, sometimes when people are asking me questions or I'm being interviewed or people are saying, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? Everything's teachable. You know, almost everything is a skill. And the only thing that's not that I've come to realize is desire. I can't teach that. I can't, you know, pass that on. You got to either want it or you don't. And um, only you can decide that. So for me, um, you know, yes, it's been challenging many different moments of my career in life in many different fields, but I have hunger, you know, I have desire. I wake up with fire in my, in my, my DNA. It's a, uh, it's woven into me. So, uh, I think that's something that I really take a lot of pride in and I'm very conscious of. Um, sometimes it's literally in my subconscious, like Sheila, you don't have a choice. You don't want to go to the gym. You're going to the gym. You don't want to make these calls. You're doing it. Um, you know, you have to do it because you know what the end goal is, you know what you're trying to do. And so that's a, a very important part of my daily method of operation, right? We call it DMO. Yeah. It's funny. Well, it's not funny, but when you mentioned desire, I think that's like one of the first biggest lessons any entrepreneur will have to learn is working with people that either want it or they don't, you know, you can't teach someone that doesn't want to learn how to like do something. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Like you're wasting your time. You'd rather take someone that has no skills, but all the desire in the world and they'll be more successful than the talented person that just doesn't care. So like you making those decisions makes such a big difference, but I'm really curious for someone in your shoes, if you could have went back when you were say 19 years old, and you could have just like, you know, smoked some, some sort of, some sort of stuff that makes you go, Oh shit, we got three to five minutes, homie. This is me from the future. I need to tell you some stuff and you better listen up. And you could basically tell yourself one or three things that would save you a ton of time, money, and just like lessons learned. Right. And obviously yeah. you're going to be like, well, I wouldn't take anything back because it's made me who I am, but that's a lame answer. So if you had to think of one or three things, what would you say? Yeah. Yeah. I've actually already started writing that letter. Um, just like Kobe wrote to himself, you know, like a letter to my younger self. And, um, I, I think one of the things is like, chill, drop your ego. You don't know anything. Shut up more than you talk. These are things that I would have said to myself when I was 19. You know, even when I watch old videos of myself or, um, think about the meetings I did or, uh, the speaking engagements I've done. I think, um, all of those things combined, I, I would say that she'll, um, shut up, <laughs> uh, she'll, uh, you know, relax too. At the same time, like, don't, uh, don't burn yourself out. You got to avoid burnout. I think at 19, I, I am such an all in person. And I think, and you know me for so long, you know, you've known me for a long time, uh, more than just a professional, you know, me as a friend and I like get so committed every, in every way to people, to opportunities, to business, to a cause. And, uh, when I was 19, it was even crazier, you know, it was like, it was like a religion to me. <laughs> and so I, um, I think that, um, I would have said, she'll find, find your balance, you know, and, 
uh, remember your, your core. And uh, it's not that serious sometimes, like relax. Um, yeah, maybe I should have smoked whatever I would have smoked to speak to me at 19 to have done it at 19. So that, you know, both 35 year old and 19 year old could both smoke and hang out with each other. <laughs> have you ever done ayahuasca? No, but I probably would love to do it, honestly. I mean, I'm not close to it at all. And I would love to go to, I have a friend, a Peruvian friend, really close friend of mine, uh, Jose, who we talk about it. We're like, dude, when are you taking me to Peru? I want to go and uh, I'll try this whole thing out. I've heard it like puts you on some other level. I heard so too. My buddy Peter did it. He like went out into the jungle. He, he already lives in Colombia, so he's, he's deep. But he went like even farther south and went into the woods where like there was eight hours of cell phone service, him and three buddies, and they met with four shamans. And like at these people's homes, like typically it's a group of like 20 people, but it was just them four somehow. Yeah. He was, he was like, it was crazy. He said it changed everything. He was like, yeah, I personally can't, I can't handle my shit. So I don't know if I would be able to <laughs> successfully do that. Um, but well, I would, I want to go with you, please. <laughs> yeah. I would like, try, I would like jump in the water and think I'm growing gills, you know, <laughs> I'm a fish. You're like, no, dude, you're supposed to focus that energy on becoming a better you. I'm like, no, I'm losing it. <laughs> but there's a lot of crazy things and life is as a learning lesson of, of just experience. Another reason why the podcast is so powerful is everybody has a different experience. And I yeah. think that the more financial success you make, I feel like there's cert there's some sort of level. Like I look at my life right now for everyone listening. And I love my, like, for the most, I, I love my, like, my life's sick. Like, and I'm not saying this to brag or be, like, whatever. But you can be so happy in a relatively, like, simple situation, right? Yeah. Happiness is not directly correlated with income. I feel like happiness is directed with value and how much value you're putting out into the universe and how you feel valued. It's yeah. like we talk about the Facebook Live and going live, right? The ability for you to go out and just put yourself out there. And just to feel like you are breaking out of the chains that society has put you on is where I think happiness comes from. And when you speak to someone and you find out what makes them happy and you can see that like nine year old version of them just getting giddy, like that's what I feel like is what we're always chasing. Would you, would you yeah. agree or disagree? You're so good at it. Yo, you are the best at that. You make people laugh, you know, and, um, it's a, it's a, it's a quality that, um, is so priceless because humor, uh, laughter is like the best medicine, you know, and people today, um, you know, with the advent of the internet and social media are comparing their lives to something that is so fake, you know, it's bad because people get online and they only put positive things of their life. They're putting filters on their face and, you know, nice moments of their life. And then all day, you know, everyone's scrolling through seeing all this and thinking about their sucky life. And they're like, ah, nah, my life sucks. <laughs> right. And um, when you can put a smile on people's face and they laugh is so special. And uh, lately I've been lucky enough to um, have a, actually a Swami at this temp local temple that I, I grew up going to. Uh, and he's like this really amazing person who also speaks some English and, I found out um, he had studied all his, uh, he, his mentor was actually the same Swami that when I was a young boy, uh, I used to go see him at the temple when I was really young. And he was like my favorite Swami because I could relate to him. He could speak English and taught me a lot, was a very big influence on my life. Uh, when it comes to that balance, when it comes to finding that center, that core, and so, um, you know, we just started these like meditation classes on Monday and uh, it, it's something that I used to not really put too much time and attention into. Uh, but now that I'm like back in my hometown and I'm like settling down, like I said, I'm moving into different chapters. I've got these weekly routine things that I'm starting to do. Like Wednesdays, I go play basketball with the same group of guys and um, it makes me a lot more grounded. Does that make sense? I'm like, I want to go see those guys hang out on Wednesdays. And I, it brings me right back 
you know, and then Mondays uh, I get to go think about how we're going to put this meditation class together because he's so good at it. And, um, you know, it, I think find for, for anybody, find, uh, find your center, you know, find your balance, find your, I think that's when you find your, your greatness and your happiness. Uh, some people do it doing sports. Some people do it in different ways. They find their happiness and their relationship. They find their happiness, uh, reading or whatnot. The, the only thing I'll tell you to avoid is don't find your happiness scrolling on Instagram or Facebook. Cause that's, that's, that's going to burn you out real fast. Right. Finding that, that Friday night essence, that thing that you end up doing and you're staying up till two in the morning and you just forget, you get lost in it. The, the joy of life. You mentioned yeah. the meditation gig and the mind. That's something that I know is a fact. It's something I'm pursuing. It's tough. We talk about it a lot on this podcast, but the fact is, is that your mind controls everything. And yeah. the fact that we're getting upset at ourselves for not being able to stay focused for 10 minutes and breathing, like it's like, it controls everything. Like we got to be working on your mind 24 seven. Like that's got like meditation should be like a human requirement that has to be something like you, you, at 12 o'clock when the church bells ring, everyone just stops and meditates. I think that's probably a religion, but uh, uh, <laughs> that is. Uh, but with that said, I, I just think it's so, so powerful, you know, just being able to control your happiness, not spiral into something that's upset, not to get too overwhelmed with life. Do you ever find yourself, and this goes back to that point of just being happy, do you ever find yourself, all, you're having a great day, you have, your life's blessed, there's so many good things going on in your life, but you're so ticked off over like one yes. person or one thing and it's just oh, nagging you and you spent like an hour just being ticked off by this one tiny freaking thing and you almost forget how great your life is. You Gratitude goes out the door. That ever happened to you? Yeah, it happened to me like two weeks ago. I went to go see Swami. <laughs> I was like, Swami, man, I, I can't get this off my mind and my heart. I have so many things to do and be grateful for and be happy about. And, you know, my life is going so great, yet uh, this one little thing bothers me. And it's sometimes it's the most important things in your life when you avoid them or they get rattled or they're shaken. Um, my only advice is to have tougher skin. I was watching, I was saying something to a buddy of mine and I, I this might be controversial, but I, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, bullying. I hate bullying. I think it's stupid. It sucks um, that kids go through it and it seems like it's even more of a thing today than it ever has been. But I mean, I got bullied, you know, and I think everyone I talk to, they always say the same thing. And I, I kind of, and I'm not an expert, but I think, if I had to put my thumb on it, I, I feel like all kids are bullies. Even the bullies are bullies. But why are we not addressing something that is like a, a, a more important thing? Like, why aren't the kids learning self-defense? Why aren't the kids learning how to have tough skin? I know without a doubt that you can't stop bullying. It's what kids do to me. It's what humans do to each other. You know what it's like? It's like lobsters. We're all like lobsters and crabs. You know, we're like bottom feeders. You ever put lobsters in a bucket? Put one, it'll climb out of the bucket. You put two lobsters in a bucket, they won't get out because they grab each other back in. And that's how we are as people. We don't like seeing someone else, you know, either on a different level than us because we feel like some sort of fear of like, oh, we're going to lose them maybe, or uh, maybe a sense of envy or jealousy. I experienced it quite a bit, especially in MLM. I mean, people see you succeeding, your, your closest friends. Sometimes they're the people that are supposed to have your back get so envious for unnecessarily, but you know, it, it's a part of society. It happens in every sociological structure, whether it's church, work, uh, family, doesn't matter. You know, people just somehow innately, uh, like crabs and lot like bottom feeders try to suck you back in. And, uh, my advice is just don't, don't let the crabs and the lobsters 
do that to you, you know, and the, and that sometimes those crabs and lobsters are dressed as your most loved ones. Sometimes they sleep next to you. Sometimes they're the ones that live next to you. Sometimes they work next to you. They just don't let their voices creep into your brain and form any wrinkles. You got to protect that. It's so important. You know, don't let a text message rock your day. Don't let, uh, get back on your horse if it does, you know, get back in your greatness and start pursuing what you're great at and, and what you love. And, um, you know, you, you get to hold the pencil of the story that you want to write. So, uh, yeah. start writing. That abundance mentality is such a game changer because that kills so much people. Ego yeah. and then not having an abundance mentality. I feel like those two things alone are what kill so much entrepreneurs, definitely in direct sales. Egos is like an obvious. People will throw away a fat check just because they're upset over something super, super small. Yeah. Or the opportunity of just abundance. Like the feeling the need that you need to push someone down to go up versus everyone rises. Like there's yeah. so much money in the world. I was reading the book Sapiens. I, I have it on Audible. And they wrote that right now. And this, when the book was published, there's $60 trillion of banknotes in the world, but there's actually only 6 trillion physical dollars in the world. It might, might've changed, but it's crazy because that's a lot of money. Yeah. And you're crabbing over someone who's made an extra 10 grand over you. And you're well, freaking 60 out. Billion also economically speaking, hate to interrupt that, but that's like comprised of gold. That's comprised of a lot of different, not just like paper, Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but that number, what's more, I got a, I got a really interesting thought on that one, $68 trillion in the next 20 to 25 years. Where do you think that's going to pour into? It's going to pour into eventually digital currencies because that's what new up and coming millennials and younger people are using. They're not even going to go to a bank to open a bank account. And uh, over time, that 68 trillion, I just posted something on social media about how money evolves and value evolves. And so, you know, in markets, they have cycles to them. So no matter how much money you're earning today, let's say you made a million bucks, but then the American government decides we're going to print, you know, 20 billion more dollars, you're going to devalue the money that you just earned without trying because... The government just inflated their their dollar. I mean, this is this is something most people don't think about in their life because they're working. And when you're working for the almighty dollar, uh, it, it, you cannot let it become your god. Like you said, there is abundance. I I think you know if people thought more like that, there'd be more peace in the mind. No, that's true. Just just thinking about it, just thinking about the concept of it. And you're right, the finality. And that's another reason why you love Bitcoin is because there's no that inflation is taken out of the equation. Oh yeah, it's it's a deflationary currency. I mean, you, you they've thought it they've really thought it through. There's a finite amount. Twenty one million bitcoins will ever be produced. Seventeen million already created. Sometimes Bitcoin gets lost, people lose it, they don't know how to access it. You know what happens to the rest of the Bitcoin? Their value goes up. So Shia, what would you say to that person that's like currently right on the cusp of making a massive decision in their life? Maybe right now they're having a phenomenal lifestyle, like they have a great job, J-O-B, but they're making great money. And although they lifestyle, their lifestyle is crazy, they just feel like undervalued, they feel like they're not living their purpose. Maybe they're making 300K a year, but really they just want to go like capture bugs out in the forest. Like, I don't know, something, something that makes them really happy. Or the other person that's on the opposite end of the spectrum who's just getting by, just making ends meet, doing the stagnation, doing the nine to five lifestyle, but not really truly living their passion and their purpose. And they have an idea. They want to step out of their boundaries. They want to make this move, but they're scared. Obviously, finances are a factor the fear of losing, the fear of failing, not knowing what to do next. What would you say to that person that's right on the cusp of making a big move in their life? I tell them to slow down. Um, don't be erratic. You know, you've built up whatever you've built up to, you know, to get to that point probably took a lot. You know, it took a lot of investment of your time and energy to get to that point in life. Um, and nothing is worth just shifting like, 
uh, on a dime for no reason, just relax. Um, that would be my first, uh, I'm never in a rush. You know, it's like the other day I posted, huh, how's, how's MLM going? What's out there? And you know, the vultures came out, everybody filled my inbox up with some type of CBD pitch and, um, you know, nothing wrong with it. And I'm sure everyone's doing, uh, has great intentions, but I said the same thing to everybody. I'm not in a rush. Like I'm chilling, you know? Uh, and it, that's because I think if you have, you know, great money already coming in that type of stability, uh, in your life should give you enough patience to actually make a sound decision on what you want to do. But why not just use the extra time you may have like the few hours. If you, if you got better at time management, let's say, you know, you're waking up at seven, but maybe we shift you to waking up at five. We just added an extra, you know, two hours a day, two times, uh, 365. We added an extra 700 hours to your, your year. So just, just wake, just that boom, that one little move, I just upped your, your, your competition level. Like you are, who's going to compete with that? You know, 700 hours of your man hours. So you, you have patience. You just sometimes have to look at it differently. Maybe you got to take a uh, time off of uh, fishing uh, or like you said, maybe you want to get into fishing or something. Uh, but maybe you're hobby fishing right now. Who knows? You, you really got to kind of plan it. Uh, some people take a year to plan their like two week vacation, but they won't take like two weeks to plan their life. How crazy is that? And that's a norm. I mean, if you ask most people what their goals are, they don't have them. Yeah. It's silly to me. Very, very silly how, you know, you could not take life that seriously. You need to have goals. You need to have an idea, a direction of where you're going. And if not, it's fine. Um, but if you do end up going to meditate and be with the shamans and do those things, you better plan on not coming back <laughs> because real, re, reality and life to be in this society requires you to have some goals. Otherwise, you, I think you might be in for um, a lot of challenge. I think the biggest mental shift I've made completely is realizing that you are capable of getting to whatever level. Because like for me, I know you even used to tell me when I was younger, like I used to always be like, kind of have that like, like, ah, like that homie can do it, but the Jones, no way. You know, like wow. it just, you create this mental block or someone, you'll hear someone that has had zero personal development experience. You'll say to them like, hey, yeah, you should start a business doing that. And they'll just be like, nah, 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 I can't do that. Like, wait, what? Like you're just conditioned to believe you cannot do it. You're conditioned to believe wow you're only capable of a certain amount of finite moves in your life. But just through all the personal development and the people I've made, I've literally made it such a habit to at least tell myself and tell everybody that's around me, even if it's like, you know, Pat, and he's talking about how we all, all should just go die. <laughs> uh, I'm like, bro, you got to believe that you are actually capable of starting that business, of go traveling to South Africa and like raising cheetahs. I know that's still making you laugh. <laughs> Shout out Pat Murray. Sometimes you need good friends to cheer you up. And sometimes, you know, occasional like, ah, life's such a drag is a funny meme. But yeah. uh, this, this is just truth. But like, you need to believe that it's possible. And if you're listening to this podcast, there's people so much less smarter, less skilled than yeah. you living your reality that you wish could happen, like your dream. And they did it just because they told themselves they could do it. Yet you keep selling yourself on some bullshit that you suck, that you're not skilled, that you're too goofy, that you're not fit enough, that you're not a good enough speaker. And then you enter this paradigm where you realize you can do it. And now it's almost a new level of depression that comes in because then yeah. you realize you can do it and you're not doing it. And now you become more upset at the ability that you're not doing it, that you get that whole like living with regret of not going after everything you've ever wanted. Isn't that crazy? It goes to show you how powerful thought is. You know, the first, one of the first chapters I ever read in personal development was Thinking Grow Rich. And it says thoughts are things. Everything in life starts as thoughts and then eventually happens, you know? Um, and so, you know, you, that's why even like having that little bit of 
uh, negativity. Let's say that the earlier question about like, oh, that, you know, you spend one hour being all negative about that one situation. You got to get rid of that negative thought as quick as possible. Uh, because at the end of the day, you are worthy. We all bleed the same. You know, we all breathe the same oxygen. We all uh, have uh, a lot of the same ability. And so, um, you know, there's some people in the world that have less fortunate circumstances uh, that are uh, a lot more challenging. I mean, if you're born in uh, some of these third world countries, I, I go to India and uh, I'm always appreciative. You know, I'm always grateful of the life I live because I see people that uh, don't have that and how hard it is for them to get out of that because poverty is it's a real thing. And more of the world lives in poverty than the world that doesn't. And so, um, you know, we've got a long way to go as a, as a people, but there's, what, 10 billion people now on this planet. And, uh, you know, we got to work hard to, to lift each other. I I tell people often about uh, aspen trees. You ever heard of uh, the story of aspen trees? Have I ever told that to you? That's where aspirin comes from, right? Yeah. I, I actually told this story to the twins. And um, it's a very important story that changed my life, actually. It was in Utah um, at, uh, uh, at an incentive trip. And I go up and we're having this snowshoe tour. Uh, I go up the mountain on this tour and the tour guide you know, she says, Sheila, you, if you rub this tree, you can, you know, put it on your skin as a sunblock. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know, we, we walk up a little bit more. She says, you can boil the bark and it turns into aspirin. And I'm like, she goes, that's where aspirin comes from. It's from aspen trees. I'm like, yo, this is a cool tree. Yeah. And so we walk up a little bit more, get to the top of the mountain. She goes, one last thing. She'll look at this whole forest. You see this whole forest. It's not really a forest. It's actually one tree. It shares the same root system. It's all one big tree. She says it's like one of the biggest organisms in the world. And I'm like, that is outrageous. Amazing. So interesting. And we come back walking down and someone on the tour tells me to hug the tree. I hug the tree thinking I'm a tree hugger. Of course, I'm going to hug the tree. And so I'm hugging the tree. I look over at the tour guide and I'm like, hey, check it out. I'm not hugging this tree. I'm hugging the whole forest. And she goes, exactly. And that's how people are. You do bad things to people, bad things happen to you because we're all connected. You do good things and good things happen to you. And so I try to wake up every day reminding myself how we're all connected, you know. And uh, have you ever, like, just thought about people and – you know that they're thinking about you too somehow, oddly, weirdly. You're like, you don't need, we don't even have to talk, but I know we've got warm thoughts towards each other. It's like a, a very powerful thing. And for anyone that never experiences that, you're going to miss out on a large part of life because that's like, it's like Avatar. Avatar is like real. Like it, that's just computer animated, but that, that's how we all are. You know what I mean? And so – uh, without getting too deep and spiritual, I, I think that uh, it goes a long way uh, when you have a positive impact on people. People text me, call me, message me every day for the great things that they've learned from me over the years at any moment, whether it was in passing, on a plane, whatever it is. And uh, it just, it's so important nowadays. I think, I think with social media, people are just more aware of everything, right? You don't need to wait till five o'clock news to come home and see what's going on in the world. Your phone tells you every day what's happening right now, right? This phone gives you more power than the president had 20 years ago. Think about it. You could do anything you want. You could video call somebody instantly. You could tweet to millions of people. You you could sell things. I mean, the phone allows you to do any. In fact, this phone's got more gigs of memory than the computer I'm on now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's insane. Yeah. And so the rate of technology and, and its growth uh, is, is getting to a scary place. I have a very uh, weird um, prediction on that. Have you ever heard of singularity? Uh, can you go over it again? 
singularity in the year 2045, a lot of uh, scientists um, and people in the Tech Valley, the, they all believe in this idea called singularity, most of them, uh, because at the rate of this automation and where AI and machine learning and deep learning, all this stuff is going, they're saying that there's a high probability that machines and robots could be the dominant species. That by that time, we no longer as humans will be the dominant species. That's like in our lifetime, Ian. <laughs> you know, 2045 is like, I think I'll be like 50. I don't know. Like what? You're telling me as a 50 year old man, I could be a robot's pet. Like there's some real scientists. Like look it up. You know, it's called singularity and it's really wild. Yeah, I'm reading a book called Neothink right now. It's like real intense philosophy. I mean, it's deep. It's it's almost cult-like, but it's like I'm opening your mind to different possibilities, right? Uh, but it just talks about the idea of like, imagine teaching a child at nine years old to look past all of the illusions in life to like yeah. the boil it down to the essence of why things are the way they are and teaching yeah. a nine-year-old that. And like the young brain is so strong and adaptive that it can think and think and think. It does make me realize that like, imagine if all of the nine-year-olds thought that way, we would cure all diseases. We would liver out how liver out. We would li figure out how to become, never die. Like the, the idea of just becoming invincible almost. We would right. just work it from some, imagine if we had a thousand, just a thousand Elon Musks versus one. Right. <laughs> and it's so crazy because i like what elon said on joe rogan's podcast you know we are all cyborgs already yeah we are literally he did say that and he's got a company that he created called uh neural link or something where you can literally they're gonna be working or they've already developed it or something like that that uh can download from the internet already they inject this compound into a layer above the brain to basically make you a computer. I mean, if you could download from Google directly into your brain, it just imagine the, the bandwidth it creates in your mind. It's nuts. And so, you know, to that point of the nine year old, I used to tell kids all the time, you know, every day, instead of hearing in your ear, you know, oh, you're good for nothing. You're stupid. You're never going to make it. You heard the opposite your whole life. Imagine you heard you're great you're amazing. You're awesome. And every night someone whispered that in your ear, every night someone told you how, how just beautiful and handsome and uh, worthy you are, how adequate you are, you know, what that would do to your psyche, what that would do to your mentality. And so, uh, I can relate big time. Uh, I think, you know, at nine year old, it, you know, is like the prime time too. And uh, again, thoughts are things, man. We are very powerful up here. The brain is the only organ that named itself. You know? Damn, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, hey, I know we're kind of wrapping this up. It's been, it's been, it's always just so always. impact worthy hearing from Shiel and just hearing from your, your journey and from I mean, just the, the books you've given, like told me about in the past and all the leadership, Jim Rome, just all the awesome lessons, constantly growing. You're so young. You're a thought leader. I'm telling you, you got, you got to start your own, like, I don't know if it's a direct sales company or something. You got to start your own gig one day just because you do have so much love and, and support <laughs> and, and, and we, we bust each other's, you know, chops all the time. But like, dude, you're, you're capable of doing everything. Like you could be the president. So is there any closing <laughs> thoughts you would want to give? And, and also uh, would like for you to tell people how they can follow you to get more. Okay. Uh, my Insta is the real shield at Bitcoin energy at Bitcoin energy. You know, I, I think on closing thoughts, you know, Ian, what you're doing with this podcast is amazing. You know, align yourself with great people in your life. Uh, find yourself great mentors. Uh, surround yourself with this and flood your mind uh, with constant gratitude and appreciation and love and uh, useful, effective, uh, important information uh, and, and drown out the rest of it. And, um, you know, I, I really hope every one of you that are listening find your greatness and uh, you keep going and you overcome uh, whatever challenges you face. 
uh, reach out anytime. Uh, and uh, Ian, keep it up. I'm really proud of you for everything that you've been doing, everything that you've been working on, uh, uh, everything that you said is mutual. I, I agree. You're so wise and you've come such a far, long way. Uh, he Actually, Ian's probably the perfect example of someone that's surrounded himself with great coaches, great people, become so coachable and uh, created a great life for himself. So everybody, Len Jones, party of two. Uh, thanks for having me, brother, on your show. And uh, good luck. Uh, anytime you need me, I'm, I'm here for you, brother. All right. Till next time, homie. Thank you for listening to another episode of Len Jones, party of two. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review and subscribe to stay up to date on our new episodes. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.